So I'm a software developer at ThoughtWorks and we have been developing three tools for the Decent project. Um, a policy drafting tool, a single sign-on and um, activity streams notifications tool. A single sign-on is a way for um, a user to be able to sign into different applications using just one password. Um, so often uh, people will have experienced this with Google or Facebook or Twitter um, being able to use those accounts to sign into other applications and that's what a single sign-on does. The great thing about this single sign-on tool we've built called Stonecutter is that um, it's open source and it can be self-hosted. So that means that um, any organisation can manage the user base for the apps within their organisation. So what that means for me as a user is that um, if I want to log into these applications, I don't have to share the fact that I'm logging in these applications with other external uh, organisations, uh, which means that I have more control and more understanding of, where, of who has access to my information, whether that's what I'm signing into, but also what information I'm sharing. Sometimes when you sign in um, to an application using, um, using a single sign-on tool from another organisation, um, there's quite a lot of information that's available to share and with Stonecutter you're making that decision what you want to put in your profile card, what information you're willing to share with these other applications because it's not connected to any other app. You're not using it for anything else. It doesn't have messages to my friends or uh, lists of my friends or lots of pictures of me. It will have only what I choose. So big data is something that uh, is a term that's used um, quite a lot lately and I think that when you are using a lot of data to gather information about what people care about, what people are interested in, how to help people, um, of course that's a wonderful use of it but it can also be used to exploit um, because uh, gathering all of this information on people means that You've seen a lot more very ta targeted advertising. There are companies out there who know more about you than you do <laughs> because of all the information they've been able to gather. So big data in itself isn't something which is bad or good. It's just information. And it's, uh, I think we need to think about how we want to share that, how we want to use it, and who should have access to it. Um, another of the tools we've built um, yeah. is called Objective 8. It's a policy drafting tool. Uh, what this means is that if I'm an organisation or a political party um, and I want to create new policy or manifestos, I can use this tool to crowdsource information from the members of my organisation or party um, to find out exactly what they care about, what their needs are, um, but also to allow that openness and transparency within an organisation about um, what the company cares about and the direction that we're moving in. So... Uh, for example, supposing um, I'm a member of a party and um, there's something that I feel we're not talking about, maybe with regards to recycling bins, then I can create a new um, objective, is what we call them, about wanting to have a more uh, robust um, policy in place about making sure that um, there are recycling bins you know, on every corner. And so I can start that objective and that means that members from... Uh, within that party um, can go and make comments on this objective, can ask questions, and from that I can write a draft. I can draft this policy which people can then also annotate and make further comments on. And then from that I can create more drafts and the drafts will get more and more, uh, well, close to what people care about. It will be using the information from the members of the party to really relate um, exactly what they need and, and what their thoughts are. So it's a really wonderful way to, uh, yes, be open about um, how policy is created, but also to make sure that the policy you're creating is the right thing. Um, at ThoughtWorks, we um, practice agile and lean methodologies. So um, that means quite a few things, but uh, with regards to um, a very important part of um, of working in this way means that you are constantly user testing 
so you are um, finding out as soon as you can what uh, the people who are going to be using your application care about, what's useful to them, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And it means that you make sure that you're building the right thing as soon as possible. Um, there's a phrase, um, fail early and fail fast. Um, and it's that idea of not being, not wanting to just sort of build something uh, in a vacuum and then release it and then actually do completely the wrong thing. But what you've done is you've found out as early as you possibly can. You put something out there, maybe it didn't work, maybe it did work, but you find out all of those things soon. Um, and yeah, you save a lot of time and you make sure that the end product is something useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, it's, it's interesting because with political parties, d- depending obviously, you know, different systems, um, but uh, there is an issue around um, when you are developing manifestos, as much as you want to include your members, you also are dealing a bit with, with a media war because if you have an idea and it's public and people want to... Um, your members are because your members have been creating this policy. There's nothing stopping another party from stealing that yeah. idea, um, which in itself you sort of wonder. Well, you know, if someone else is stealing the idea, then it's great. But if you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to have, because um, politi- political parties have an overall idea of obviously how they believe the country should be run and how to balance everything so that, you know, the people um, have the best, um, well, have, I guess, the best lives that they can, really. So um, for another party to steal your one idea, which, which might help them, it's, it, it's difficult. So I think that um, they're, building these tools is a great thing. And I think allowing political parties to, um, or rather giving them, uh, the idea of being more open about politics, being more uh, transparent about how they come to the ideas that they come to is a very good thing. It make, will make people, I really believe it will make people connect with politics more. It will make them feel more involved because at the moment, um, in, a, in a lot of places, and certainly in Britain, um, you feel that you, know, you, you vote... Uh, once every <laughs> four or five years and you know you occasionally have a referendum and there are other things you can do but for a lot of people they feel as quite disconnected and there are plenty of people who don't vote at all so I think that um, allowing people citizens an easier way to engage with what's happening in politics and to feel like their voices are being heard and not through a committee or through um, or even through a union, it's, it's about something much more direct than that, instead of all of these different levels of hierarchy that you have to go through to, to actually have your voice heard. A lot of the time when a um, member of... Uh, when, a mem- when a politician is talking about an idea or a policy, uh, you find that the conversation is not always about people and more often it's about the economy. Um, and the I'm sorry, I'm trying to think how to put this to words. Um, oh, no, but plenty of people still very much value success based on how much money they make, and that's just the realities of a capitalist society. I think enabling people to have the opportunity to think about the great thing about free coin is that. It's something which is smaller. It's more about, uh, you know, you can have a currency within a community. You can have a currency within... It's not sort of something which is uh, necessarily countrywide. And I think that you can think more about how you want to... Um, if you imagine... Uh, like there was, there was a while ago, there was a... Um, they created a currency in Brixton, which was a poor area in London. And they did this because... Uh, they were trying to keep more money in bricks and they wanted people to buy locally. And I, I mean, I, I thought it was, when I heard about it, I thought it was a very interesting idea. And I think that that's kind of what Freecoin has done. Um, it's, it, it's enabling people to have local currencies in a much easier, more, more accessible way. And by doing that, it means that people are 
in my opinion, I think people are more likely to um, be more involved in what is happening closer to them. Um, I think that uh, perhaps um, by having currencies that are used within whether it's within organizations or whether it's in um, smaller areas or however you want to do this, um, I think it's I think it means you think about it more. You think about where your money is going. You think about the fact that you know you're not just purchasing something that, that by by choosing to shop somewhere or by choosing to spend your money somewhere, you are also providing you're supporting another organization and thinking about who it is which communities or shops you want to support. Um, so, well, I think that a lot of the tools we've built apply across all sorts of industries. I've spoken a lot about political parties because they think that's, well, it's a big part of where the original motivation came from, but, uh, social currencies and crowdsourcing ideas, um, and, uh, decentralized single sign-ons, these are things that can be used across so many different areas of life and industries. Um, I think that um, there's, the arts are, an, uh, the arts is an industry, sorry. The arts is an industry <laughs> um, that is already very collaborative. Um, and I think that it's starting to think about how um well i guess what what useful way you can uh network with people you can uh crowdsource uh funding for your projects but it's not just about funding it's also about ideas um and i think that um 